Acting Secretary Palmieri, members of the council, guests and friends, uh, on behalf of our Board of Trustees, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you this evening. And let me thank all of those people who contributed so generously to our uh, reception fund for sponsoring this evening's reception. And next time I'll, I'll only ask the contributors to clap. <laughs> Our next program, as most of you know, will be uh, on uh, uh, President Xi and uh, his third revolution and the future of U.S.-China uh, relations. That'll be on the 21st, two weeks from today in this room. And our guest is Dr. Elizabeth Economy, who runs the Asia Group at the Council on Foreign Relations in, in New York. And it promises to be a marvelous evening. But tonight we're, we're covering, uh, I think your husband wants you over there. He's, <laughs> he's wa waving frantically. In my family, it's the reverse. I, my wife's always trying to find me the proper place to be. The, uh, the topic for this evening, of course, uh, deals with the Western Hemisphere and the United States engagement. Um, no one has to be reminded how long it's been a centerpiece of our foreign policy and certainly remains of huge importance to us today. And it is our closest and most valuable region in many ways. And so we're absolutely delighted that we have someone with us tonight who can, with authority, uh, address the question of American interests, uh, single out among the myriad of problems that are down there, those which are most pressing, and uh, the nature of those policies and our strategies for achieving them. So we're absolutely delighted that uh, the Acting Assistant Secretary is, is with us this evening. Uh, as most of you know, he. He's a graduate of Princeton, political science. He was at the University of Texas Johnson School of Public Affairs for a year. And uh, during his State Department career, he got a master's degree in international strategy at the War College. Uh, he's uh, been posted to a variety of countries, mostly in the Caribbean, actually. Uh, and uh, he also, interestingly, after having served as in the office, I think he led the office uh, for, uh, in, for Latin America and the Caribbean for uh, uh, international narcotics and law enforcement, part of that bureau. And then after that, he had a similar position uh, in Baghdad. And the position in Baghdad was uh, prefaced by a, another experience of another kind, that is uh, running an office uh, for uh, being responsible for the Near East, uh, South and Central uh, Asia, uh, again, for the drug uh, international narcotics and, and law enforcement. Um, but more recently, he's uh, held major positions within the Bureau of uh, Western Hemisphere Affairs. Uh, he's uh, been in charge of an office which was responsible for policy and programs and, and coordination and then uh, was the uh, Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary for uh, um, the southern part of, of, uh, of Latin America, and then later became the Principal Deputy, and from that position he achieved his current position, which is Acting Assistant Secretary. And as we all know, the, the meeting of the Organization of American States has just finished. We're absolutely delighted that he was good enough to join us so quickly upon the end of that particular uh, major event. Uh, so we certainly look forward uh, to his authoritative uh, presentation. It's my great pleasure uh, to present Acting Assistant Palmieri to you. Good evening. Uh, let me, let me start by first thanking the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs, um, President Frank Byrd, and, and the staff here who have really put together a wonderful event. And we're, we're excited uh, at the State Department to be up here 
participating and having an opportunity to share with all of you uh, a little bit of uh, what uh, we are doing and to explain uh, the, the, the key issues that are, are out there in our hemisphere and to let you know how the uh, administration of President Donald Trump is approaching the region. And as uh, President Byrd noted, today's issue, uh, today's session is really very timely. And I'd like to provide you an overview of our policies and priorities for the hemisphere during a period of very sustained high-level engagement with this region. First and foremost, the United States will always protect its security interests and the prosperity of our people. We know that a democratic, prosperous, and secure Western hemisphere enhances our own national security and benefits our economy. We build our policies toward the region on that premise. As many of you know, the United States shares common values and strong economic bonds with countries in the region. These connections bind us to the other 34 independent nations of the Western Hemisphere more closely than to any other region in the world. With the Summit of Americas uh, in Peru in April, uh, the Organization of American States, the OAS, General Assembly in Washington this week, the 44th G7 Summit in Canada starting tomorrow, and the first ever G20 Summit uh, hosted in a South American city in Argentina this November, it truly is a year of robust engagement in the Americas. So I'll lay out uh, some issues in some priority countries. First, our economic engagement with the Americas cannot be overstated. The numbers truly speak for themselves. The United States is the top trading partner for more than half of the countries in the region. We trade twice as much with this hemisphere as we do with China, Japan, and India combined. Twice as much. The United States has free trade agreements with 20 countries around the world. 12 of those countries are in the Western Hemisphere. We traded $1.8 trillion in goods and services within this hemisphere last year, supporting millions of US jobs and leading to an $8 billion goods and services trade surplus with the region in 2017. Our economic engagement is underpinned by respect for international law and shared ideals. This is why the United States remains the partner of choice throughout this hemisphere. Our car, our, we share common values, that our peoples have a right to democracy, that our governments have an obligation to promote and defend it, and that the social, political, and economic development of our peoples in this hemisphere depends on our commitment and full exercise of it. Our shared values include fair market practices, respecting our citizens' human rights, the forthright defense of the security and prosperity of our citizens and our nations, and a commitment to honest dealing in how governments spend the public resources entrusted to them by their citizens. These values define how we deal with one another, both as citizens of our respective nations and as economic actors in the global marketplace. The United States reaffirmed its commitment to our partnership with the Americas at the eighth summit of the Americas in Lima in April. The central theme of that summit was democratic governance against corruption. Corruption is a plague that corrodes institutions and trust in democracy worldwide. And we have felt this impact, its impact in this region. The stand against corruption and criminality reflects, reflects long-held beliefs in our own country. We respect inter international law, and we do not tolerate corrupt practices abroad that we would find unacceptable at home. For many decades now, we have enshrined in our national legislation strict rules barring U.S. citizens and U.S. businesses from bribing any foreign official to secure an improper advantage. 
Our laws impose strict penalties for those who step across that line. And I know that our companies prefer to operate in environments where the playing field is level and where corruption has no role. Citizens across the Americas have demonstrated the increasing intolerance for corruption and the region's institutions are responding. Recent steps taken against corruption in Guatemala, Peru, and Brazil reflect strong institutional responses. The, in, the, the leadership shown by Brazilian investigators and by their counterparts in many other countries throughout the hemisphere is truly impressive. As the Odebrecht Construction Company case has unfolded across this hemisphere, it has revealed corruption's endemic nature. But more importantly, it has shown how the brave and inspired efforts of many citizens from countries across this hemisphere and those public servants of those countries can effectively begin to end the impunity that corruption inspires. At the Summit of the Americas, leaders of the hemisphere accepted the Lima commitment. It is a political declaration that marks a watershed in the willingness of leaders to acknowledge their responsibility for, address, for addressing corruption as a region and in their own individual countries. The Lima commitment provides a useful roadmap outlining specific steps governments can take to curb corruption and promote transparency, including furthering a culture of citizen participation in anti-corruption efforts. It also encourages the effective participation of civil society and the private sector in public policies to prevent and deter corruption. We believe the Lima commitment will ultimately underscore that the year 2018 presents a tipping point. We hope it will be seen as the year in, in which the region's governments embrace their responsibility to restore their people's trust in democracy. Unfortunately, corruption is not the only challenge we must confront in this hemisphere. Another pre pressing issue is transnational crime. We rely on strong partnerships to fight transnational criminal organizations, and we work with our partners to disrupt illicit networks and trafficking routes that know no borders and harm people from all walks of life. The United States acknowledges our role, of course, as a major market for illicit drug consumption and the need for regional cooperation to combat those challenges. The Merida Initiative in Mexico, the Central America Regional Security Initiative, the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative are all essential tools in addressing this threat. Continued bilateral cooperation with Colombia Peru, and others in South and Central America, along with multilateral efforts through the Organization of American States, are also imperative. In December 2017, we convened with Mexico our second meeting of the strategic dialogue on disrupting transnational criminal organizations. We discussed joint strategic efforts to disrupt these, these groups by attacking their business model prioritizing efforts against drug production, and preventing the cross-border movement of drugs, weapons, uh, and illicit revenue. Through the Merida Initiative, we work alongside Mexico to support Mexico's efforts to improve security, strengthen its own rule of law, and promote greater respect for human rights. Our strategy in Central America seeks to address the security governance, and economic development challenges in that region. Our strategy complements the Alliance for Prosperity, the more than $2 billion reform initiative of the governments of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. These countries are putting their own resources on the line in a way we have not seen ever before, and our aid serves to promote their investments. Following our 2017 Conference on Security and Prosperity in Central America, co-hosted by the United States and Mexico, 
our two countries have embarked on a joint initiative to promote security and stability in those same Northern Triangle countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Mexico is a valued partner in that effort. Because our mutual security and prosperity are connected, we will work together in new ways to counter the illicit activity that causes instability in communities and drives illegal immigration to the United States. Through the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, we are working to enhance maritime interdictions, to build institutions that can counter corruption, and better cooperate to protect what has been described as our third, our third border in the Caribbean. Colombia is one of our stronger and most reliable partners in the region, and we continue to support its efforts to implement its peace accord with the FARC that ended a 52-year war. We are urging Colombia to do even more to reverse an alarming growth in coca cultivation and cocaine production. From 2013 to 2016, coca cultivation surged 134% and cocaine production 209%. At the U.S.-Columbia High Level Dialogue on March 1st, the United States and Colombia agreed to expand counter-narcotics cooperation over the next five years with the shared goal of reducing Colombia's cocaine production and coca cultivation by 50% of current levels by 2023. At the regional level, we are supporting initiatives at the Organization of American States Inter-American Drug Control Commission to disrupt drug supply and curb regional demand for drugs. Whether building capacity to counter cyber threats, supporting demining in Colombia, or combating trafficking in persons, the United States is committed to deepening our security relationships with the countries across this region in the years ahead. Sustaining economic growth and ensuring security in the region requires strong democratic institutions that respond to the needs of our citizens and operate in ways that are consistent with the rule of law. So please, let me talk a little bit about democracy. Strong representative democratic institutions that safeguard fundamental freedoms underpin regional prosperity and security. Latin America has largely transformed itself into a region of vibrant and peaceful democracies. Seven Latin American countries have held or will hold presidential elections in 2018, including key partners like Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. While most of the region enjoys democratic rule, Venezuela and other outliers, such as Cuba and Nicaragua, continue to undermine the region's shared vision of effective democratic governance as enshrined in the Inter-American Democratic Charter. The United States remains committed to championing freedom and to standing with the peoples of Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba in their struggle to achieve the liberty they deserve. We look to our partners, including civil society, and civil society organizations, to join us in speaking up whenever and wherever the hemisphere's shared democratic principles come under attack. In Cuba, the region continues its repressive hold on power and authoritarian rule despite this recent transition to a new president. President Trump's policy, adopted in June of 2017, emphasizes advancing human rights and democracy and is guided by ensuring U.S. engagement stands in solidarity with the Cuban people. This policy aims to ensure that U.S. engagement benefits the Cuban people and continues our commitment to strengthening the growing, albeit small, Cuban private sector. The policy ensures that the military, intelligence, and security services of that government will not benefit from U.S. benefit from U.S. investment or travel. 
and it aims to help the Cuban people grow their private sector and expand their access to internet services and uncensored information. In Nicaragua, we are in the midst of a very real crisis today. Over the last three weeks, we condemn the violence and the excessive force used against student demonstrators, resulting in more than 125 deaths and hundreds more wounded since protests began at the end of April. We call on the government of Nicaragua to fully implement the recommendations of the Independent Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and to act upon its findings to ensure accountability and justice for the human rights abuses, murders, and other violations. We support a broad-based dialogue to resolve that conflict and urge the Nicaraguan government to negotiate in good faith to achieve a democratic future for all Nicaraguans. In Venezuela, sadly, democracy has been completely undermined by the Maduro regime. We support the Venezuelan people's sovereign right to elect their representatives through free, fair, and transparent elections. And we join the democratic nations of the world in standing by the Venezuelan people as they seek to return to the stable and prosper prosperous democracy they deserve. Our leaders at the Summit of the Americas addressed this crisis in Venezuela. We were pleased to join with our partners, Argentina, the Bahamas, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Guyana, Honduras, Mexico, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, and St. Lucia to issue a declaration on Venezuela at that summit in April. With our partners, we called on the Venezuelan government to hold free, fair, transparent, democratic process without political prisoners, and with the full participation of all political parties. But despite those calls at the Summit of the Americas for a free and fair election, the May 20 elections in Venezuela did not meet those standards. We condemned, along with the European Union, the Lima Group of 14 countries in the hemisphere, the Vatican, and over 40 countries, the fraudulent election that took place in Venezuela on May 20. And I'll get back to more of our thinking on that so-called election shortly. But let me also highlight another key outcome of the summit. The region collectively expressed our concern for the growing numbers of Venezuelans forced to leave their country because of the crisis. The Declaration on Venezuela urges the United Nations and the Organization of American States to implement a humanitarian assistance program to address the shortages and sufferings of the Venezuelan people. It also emphasized the importance of the international community's support for the economic recovery of Venezuela once democratic and constitutional order has been restored. Every day, some 5,000 Venezuelans flee the land of their birth. It is being, it is, not it is being, it is the largest cross-border mass exodus in our hemisphere's history. The Office of the UN Commissioner for Refugees estimates that approximately 1.5 million Venezuelans fled to other countries in Latin America and the Caribbean in the past three years and an outflow of another 1.8 million is expected this year. Many of the Venezuelans fleeing their homeland have entered Colombia, Colombia, Brazil, Chile, and nearly every other country in our region, including the United States. And President Trump has made it clear. The United States of America will not stand by idly as Venezuela crumbles. We are using the full range of our diplomatic and economic tools to support the Venezuelan people's efforts to restore their democracy and return to prosperity. We have sanctions in place designed to put pressure on those in the Maduro regime most responsible for human rights abuses, 
while also limiting their ability to use the U.S. financialist system to enjoy their corrupt gains. The administration has imposed strict financial sanctions on more than 50 current or former senior Venezuelan officials, including the president and the vice president. We, we've sanctioned the so-called Petro cryptocurrency, protecting unwitting investors from the Maduro regime's latest fraud, and also announced additional sanctions to ensure that the Venezuelan state assets are not further liquidated for the corrupt Maduro, Maduro regime's purposes at the expense of the Venezuelan people. We are also addressing the humanitarian component of this crisis by supporting those Venezuelans who've been forced to flee their homes. Vice President Pence announced nearly $16 million of direct aid for, for the Venezuela crisis regional response at the summit in Lima. In May, Deputy Secretary of State John Sullivan announced an additional $18.5 million in bilateral assistance for the government of Colombia's efforts to address the influx of the more than 600,000 Venezuelans who are in that country seeking safety. In total, the U.S. humanitarian response to the Venezuelan crisis comes to more than $39 million just since 2017. So let me turn briefly to the so-called Venezuelan elections a few weeks ago. It's important to rem remember that they were the culmination of an illegitimate process months and years in the making. This process was choreographed by a regime so unpopular and so afraid of its own people it would not risk real competition, which you can see in the way the regime manipulated the election. First, the regime stacked the Venezuelan courts and the National Electoral Council with partisan members aligned with, it, its, with the regime itself. It silenced dissenting voices. It banned major opposition parties and prominent leaders from even running for the office. And, on, and as of May 14th, it had more than 338 political prisoners in jail. That is more political prisoners than in all other countries in the hemisphere combined. The regime stifled the free press and state resources dominated media co coverage, unfairly favoring the incumbent. But worst of all, the regime selectively parceled out food to manipulate the votes of hungry Venezuelans. This in a society where $3 is now the monthly minimum wage. I want to provide a few more details on this point. It is blatant vote buying, but it goes much farther than what we just saw on election day. The regime has been doing this for several elections now, using high-tech electronic cash cards to track voters. And the food, medicine, and other social services they receive. We have seen multiple reports that individuals or families or even whole neighborhoods that did not vote for the regime got their access to subsidized food benefits cut off. In a country with rampant malnutrition, where people are struggling to make ends meet, this is a clear threat. Either you vote for the regime or you explain to your family why there's no food on the kitchen table. The regime bears the responsibility for the suffering of the Venezuelan people. Looking at this whole fraudulent process, I think Secretary Pompeo's tweet summed it up well. These sham elections change nothing. The electoral process that culminated on May 20th was illegitimate, and you do not get legitimate results from an illegitimate process. Nicolas Maduro and his regime have devastated Venezuela's economy and its democracy. This is a man-made disaster. 
They fail to defend the people's right to democracy as reflected in the OAS Charter and in the Inter-American Democratic Charter. In remarks at the OAS in May, Vice President Pence challenged the member states to do what the Democratic Charter asks of us when faced with an unconstitutional interruption in the democratic order of a member state. Suspend that member state from the Organization of American States. Suspension is not an end in itself and does not preclude our continuing engagement to address a situation that will no doubt get worse before it gets better. But suspension shows that the OAS, the region, the hemisphere, is prepared to act in accordance with our principles and with our own procedures. Suspension sends a powerful signal to the Maduro regime. Only real elections will allow your government to participate in this family of nations. This past week in Washington at the OAS General Assembly, Secretary Pompeo worked with our hemispheric partners to send that powerful message. Earlier this week, the United States and 18 other foreign ministers delivered a strong statement on the current crisis in Venezuela. The OAS member states approved a resolution on the situation in Venezuela, which noted the May 20 electoral process lacked legitimacy and reiterated that a, rep a rupture of democratic order had occurred. The resolution urges the Venezuelan government to accept the humanitarian assistance of the international community and sets the procedural steps for Venezuela's eventual suspension under the Inter-American Democratic Charter. The resolution also calls on member states and the OAS permanent observers to implement economic, political, and financial measures to apply pressure on the Maduro regime. The resolution is a clear signal. In this Western Hemisphere, we will not tolerate authoritarian regimes that abuse their population's human rights. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with a few thoughts on our priorities. We will continue to work with our regional partners to help restore democracy to Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. We will look to the declarations made with our regional partners at the Summit of the Americas, the OAS General Assembly, the G7 meeting, the G20 meeting to help guide U.S. engagement throughout the Americas. We will work to create a hemisphere that is more secure, more prosperous, and more democratic for all of us in the Americas, and most importantly, for the United States of America. Thank you very much, and I look forward to a, uh, a good question and answer session. Sir, the question is to comment on uh, the recent tariffs uh, that have been imposed uh, on countries uh, in the hemisphere. Um, so what I would say is uh, President Trump's administration and our U.S. Trade Representative and the Department of Commerce under Secretary Wilbur Ross are fully committed to ensuring that our trade relations are balanced uh, and, uh, and fair. And tariffs are designed uh, under the administration to also ensure that critical national security uh, elements of our economy are, are, are protected and able to be there uh, uh, should we have a future crisis. Right there. Could you be more specific about in Colombia What's being done to discourage coca production? It's not going to be burning the coca fields. It's got to be something else. And then the other question I have has to do with administration policy on Cuba. We haven't heard much about the changes, and I'd like to know what you expect the policy is going to be in terms of American businesses in going to Cuba and also in terms of tourism and travel. <coughs> The two questions are to specifically give some more uh, detail on what Colombia is doing 
uh, to uh, reduce uh, the coca cultivation and cocaine production. And um, the second part of the question was on Cuba, asking uh, what, uh, uh, what the uh, new policy, what impact it will have on U.S. businesses, and uh, I believe you used the term tourism. Um, I'll take the second question first. Uh, uh, tourism is prohibited to uh, Cuba under the Cuban embargo. What is allowed under the regulations is purposeful travel, where uh, visitors to Cuba are engaged in a program that uh, directly interacts with C individual Cubans in a, a meaningful program to understand the political, economic, and social conditions uh, in the country. But uh, tur tourism, per se, is not pro prohibited. That the people to people travel will continue? That's correct. Uh, as far as the, um, the U.S. Uh, business engagement on the island, we are trying to develop uh, and promote U.S. Uh, engagement, uh, economic engagement, that is directed to the small but growing private sector in Cuba. Over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, uh, the private sector has now grown to about 25% of the Cuban economy. Uh, and uh, most of the new job creation has been a result of uh, these small restaurants, uh, B&B &B, uh, 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 operations that are underway, some of the uh, services associated with uh, the growing numbers of international visitors who come, uh, who come to Cuba. There are also some areas where in agriculture, um, and in uh, U.S. equipment sales that uh, there is an effort to uh, uh, help U.S. companies fulfill existing, existing contracts. With respect to the situation in Colombia, uh, the Colombian government is taking a three-pronged approach. Uh, they have significantly ramped up their government's ability, their police forces, with their naval and military forces to interdict uh, greater amounts of uh, cocaine once it is produced and prevent it from ever leaving uh, the, uh, the, the country. In addition, they have both a voluntary eradication program that is part of the peace process that is designed in those areas where the FARC was most prevalent to convert uh, those small individual farmers who have been cultivating coca to licit uh, uh, activities, to licit, uh, illicit crops. The voluntary, the voluntary eradication program I don't think has achieved, and I don't think, I know, hasn't achieved the levels uh, that the Colombian government uh, has, uh, has desired. But they also have a forced eradication program. When voluntary eradication will not work, uh, the Colombian government is going in and uh, uh, forcibly eradicating uh, coca cultivation. And in that respect, they've far exceeded uh, the goals that they have set themselves uh, by about 25% in the last calendar year. They've got to do a lot more. Uh, the numbers are continuing to go up, and it is something we are uh, very concerned about. But uh, we are at the end of the uh, Santos administration's term of office. Uh, there was uh, a first round of elections in uh, Colombia in May. There is now a runoff on June 17th. Uh, the winner of that election will be taking office in the first week of August, and I can assure you that um, uh, this growing uh, coca cultivation and cocaine production uh, issue is going to be uh, at the forefront of uh, any discussions we have with the new government. And the new government, uh, I will say, is going to have to take a long, hard look at how this three-pronged uh, effort is working or not working. Uh, and there are more than, there's more than one expert out there uh, and maybe some people in the audience who will recall that uh, in 2010, when uh, coca cultivation was at its lowest level in, in Colombia under the previous uh, um, planned Colombia uh, assistance effort, uh, there was a 
very significant aerial eradication program that eradicated more than 100,000 hectares uh, of, uh, of coca in a single year. And that uh, aerial eradication program was extremely effective because it was so certain. Uh, um, I think it, it, it's pretty common sense. If you can kill the coca plant while it's in the ground where you know where it is, it's a heck of a lot easier than trying to chase down cocaine that's uh, been turned into paste and is being moved out of the country through any number of different means. So uh, I, I do think eradication is going to be a significant uh, a part of uh, getting that effort under control. But the current government has agreed to a plan. Uh, it's going to be up to the next government to figure out how we execute that and achieve the 50% reduction over the next five years. You're not going to solve this uh, issue from one year to the next. It's going to take a sustained, engaged approach uh, by the government of Colombia, but with the help of the United States and other partners uh, to really uh, get after that problem. I'll go back there and then here, sir. Uh, I have written to my congressmen. I have written to my senators. I am a mother. I'm a grandmother. I am a teacher for 36 years. You spoke about humanitarian. You spoke about human rights. You spoke about people fleeing from Venezuela. But yet, as we sit here, there are children who have been taken from their parents, young children, and they are they, where, what if they get up in the night and they have to go to the bathroom? Where are they getting their meals? They're away from their parents. Can you do something? You're from the State Department. Please, please do something about those children. Thank you. Uh, the question was related to um, the situation at our southwest border where we have seen uh, over the last year uh, an increase in uh, 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 numbers of uh, individuals, illegal migrants coming, coming from, coming please, coming from uh, uh, Central America, arriving at our border and uh, currently uh, parents being separated from children and the need for us to do more. As I spoke in the speech, as I spoke in the speech, we have a strategy in Central America that is designed to both address the security problems in these home communities in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. There are, there are huge uh, criminality issues in those countries. Our programs are helping reduce uh, the prevalence of gang activity in, in many communities, not all. Uh, and as a complement to that, we know that you just can't provide security. You've got to provide economic opportunity and hope. And so we are working with all three governments to expand economic investment in the region and to support uh, policies and programs that can provide greater economic opportunity. With regard to the specific situation of children being separated uh, from their parents at our border, uh, I'd have to refer you to the Department of Homeland Security. The State Department, the State Department uh, is doing all we can to get at the underlying conditions uh, overseas that are driving a lot of this uh, uh, illegal migration. Here. Early in my career, I was a, had a minor involvement and the negotiations for NAFTA. I've heard President Trump say that it's not reciprocal, that was a bad deal. Uh, I can tell you, I, I spent the rest of my career enforcing NAFTA. Uh, there's a common rule of origin. If it comes south, it's duty free. If it comes north, it's duty free. Uh, if, the, if the, they meet the rules of origin, the qualified rules of origin, it's reciprocal. What is not reciprocal, what is a, you, know, you may disagree with the zero duty rate. That's fine. You disagree with free trade, that's fine. But what's not reciprocal about it? Why is it a bad deal? Uh, NAFTA. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think it's... It, the question is... Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. The question is, why is NAFTA a bad deal? And uh, um, uh, this, uh, the questioner has worked for the uh, 
Customs and Border Patrol agency and was personally involved in uh, processing goods that went back and forth uh, through all three countries. There's no question that um, the NAFTA deal, the NAFTA trade agreement, was approved more than 25 years ago. It was approved before we had, you know, the the e the electronic digital uh, commerce that we now have. There's uh, a great effort underway to modernize that agreement and rebalance. There have been a number uh, of jobs that did leave this country uh, to Mexico. And uh, while there is a lot of economic activity that you uh, outlined that takes place between Canada, Mexico, and the United States, and out from our country as well, uh, there's no question that the deal should be modernized, it should be updated, and, and so that it continue to provide the benefits on a, a more balanced way to all three countries. Over here. Can you elaborate on the national security concerns that we have with uh, Canada, Mexico, and European Union that are being used to justify the tariffs? <laughs> The question is, can I elaborate on the national security concerns related to uh, Canada, Mexico, the European Union, uh, as it relates to the tariffs that are imposed? Uh, again, I, um, under Section 232 of uh, uh, the U.S. Um, uh, Department of Commerce Code uh, related to trade, uh, there is a specific um, element that requires the president or gives the president the authority to look at critical national security industries like steel, like aluminum, that are a vital part of our own uh, economy, our own economy. And uh, the president uh, and the Department of Commerce have gone through an extensive review process where they have determined that uh, these uh, tariffs will will protect uh, our national security interests in those industries. Uh, and uh, I would have to refer you to the Commerce Department for more specific details about that, uh, about that uh, uh, specific analysis. I'm sorry I don't have that. Uh, we can go here and then I'll come back to this side. Yes, sir. Uh, Trump has decided he's going to impose tariffs. You also mentioned that uh, from an economic standpoint, in order for these countries to turn themselves around, they need to have economic growth. How do you justify tariffs when you're trying to grow their economy to be beneficial to themselves so that they don't have to be as dependent on us as we want them to be and still we generate a surplus? How do you do this? I, I think the, the question is, uh, I noted in my remarks that there are, uh, we run an $8 billion surplus uh, in trade throughout this hemisphere. And the question is, even with that surplus, how do we justify uh, in the United States the imposition on tariffs on countries uh, that uh, are still in uh, an economic development phase and is it counter counterproductive? Is that a fair uh, characterization? Uh, the, again, the, uh, the tariffs are targeted to specific countries and to specific industries. They are not uh, broad-based against all trade that we are doing throughout this hemisphere. Uh, and uh, again, they are tied directly to the U.S. national security interests of those uh, specific industries. I'll go over here. I assume the Trump administration supports the Monroe Doctrine. I wonder if you consider that the Russian involvement in the 2016 election violates the Monroe Doctrine and what the Trump administration proposes to do about that. I like the way you tied that to the Western Hemisphere broader policy. Uh, and the, the Trump administration very much supports uh, the... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the question is... Given the, the Monroe Doctrine, how would I uh, explain uh, the response to Russian interference in uh, the 2016 election? Uh, I will say uh, simply that the Monroe Doctrine is uh, uh, an element of the Trump administration's approach to this hemisphere. 
um, the national security strategy that the Trump administration issued in uh, December of last year uh, focuses on how external actors like Russia, like Ch China, do pose uh, a threat to this hemisphere. Uh, and with respect to the specific question, uh, uh, I think I'd have to defer that to, uh, to the White House. It, it's, it's, it's not a State Department competency. Thank you. Other question? I'd like to, to narrow a previous question, the question of immigrants coming across the border and, and children being taken from their parents if they were uh, put in detention. In, from what I've read, in some cases at least, we're talking about immigrants <coughs> seeking asylum. And presumably some of them have a reasonable expectation of asylum under international law. Now, I used to work at the Treasury Department in the international section, and my understanding is the State Department covers international law. So I wanted to know from you, what is the state's role in terms of people seeking asylum in the US? Right. The question is, what is the State Department's role in um, individuals who are seeking asylum uh, in the United States. And it is, uh, it is definitely a, a major issue related to the people who are arriving at our southwest border. They are presenting themselves uh, to U.S. authorities uh, and then seeking uh, asylum. Uh, the State Department's role in the refugee asylum process uh, really is limited to uh, seeking and assisting refugees outside of the U.S. border. Uh, in, uh, for instance, we have significant uh, operations in Colombia where we've had displaced uh, people. Uh, we had a, a program in Central America in 2014 at the height of, uh, of that uh, crisis. Uh, we have a smaller program there now, but we process refugee claims overseas. Once an individual enters the territory of the United States, the Department of Homeland Security Citizen Citizenship Services uh, 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 Agency is responsible for the adjudication of asylum claims. So when you're outside of the U.S. borders, the State Department helps process refugee claims that are based on uh, political uh, conditions. And uh, uh, when you cross the border and present yourself inside the United States, again, it's the Department of Homeland Security that processes those claims. Can I contrast the uh, Obama administration's approach uh, to uh, the migration crisis and the Trump administration's approach. From a State Department's perspective, there has been uh, some important continuity. I, I outlined the strategy in Central America where we are working with this Alliance for Prosperity program of the three Northern Triangle countries of uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. We are working on programs that are designed to keep young uh, people away from gangs. We have uh, gang intervention programs. We have community-based uh, police athletic leagues. We are trying to create space in a lot of these communities where young people uh, will not feel threatened, where they can uh, continue to do uh, uh, finish their education. And then uh, we also have economic investments. And in that respect, uh, the approaches from a State Department perspective have been somewhat consistent. We have stepped up our efforts to help all three governments and the government of Mexico strengthen their, their ability to control their own borders and to prevent uh, a lot of irregular migration from happening. One of the reasons for that is obviously we want fewer people arriving at our southwest border, but also People who make that dangerous journey in an undocumented, irregular fashion uh, from their home communities are quite often incredibly exploited. They're trafficked, they're trafficked and uh, 
in that respect, strengthening border controls is another key uh, key element uh, that's a bit different. Other questions? Yes, sir. Can you give a, a snapshot or framework for the uh, status of staffing for State Department or Western Hemisphere positions? Yeah. Well, um, I have been acting since January. Oh, the question is, uh, could I give a quick uh, snapshot of what the staffing pattern uh, at the uh, uh, at the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs are at the State Department? Uh, I have been the acting Assistant Secretary since January twentieth, two thousand seventeen. Uh, we uh, we do not have a confirmed uh, uh, Assistant Secretary. We do have a nominee. Uh, uh, she is currently uh, scheduled to have her uh, confirmation hearing before the United States Senate um, uh, next uh, Thursday, uh, June 14th. Uh, we're looking forward to her coming on board. Uh, she is a political appointee who will, who will join our bureau and lead our bureau. Uh, we've had a number of ambassadors uh, nominated throughout the hemisphere. Uh, we have new ambassadors in Canada, in uh, Costa Rica, uh, in Argentina. Uh, we have uh, nominees that have been waiting for confirmation uh, in, um, in uh, Buenos, I'm sorry, in the Bahamas, in uh, Chile, and in Uruguay. Um, the career people in the Bureau, I think, have all stepped up. We are uh, working, I think, uh, very effectively uh, to uh, execute the president's policies, but it will be uh, it will be welcome to have uh, an assistant secretary confirmed by the Senate. Thank you. I don't know if that's the last question. I'm uh, I'm available. Thank you. This, this is the first time in a while uh, that we haven't had questions go on for another seven or eight minutes. And, uh, I think that's because all of you support the current policy so strongly. <laughs> and and you, you're expressing great satisfaction. I often remark to people about what a marvelous audience uh, the council provides that uh, no matter how serious the policy differences are that questions are always <laughs> asked in a uh, an appropriate civilized manner and that uh, uh, one's angst doesn't get out of control at our council sessions. I was beginning to wonder there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, Robbie Harris wanted me to, to also comment on how wonderful the questions were tonight. Um, but that would lead to an argument between Robbie and me for a long time. <laughs> if, in, if I could just add, yes. this is uh, what a vibrant democracy should look like. And uh, uh, I'm more than happy to come up here and answer any, any questions. So thank you very much. The, uh, well, I thought your answers were as direct as they could be. And uh, your presentation was a nice overview. Uh, I think we got a much clearer picture of a lot of items. And uh, the range of questions uh, covered a good amount of ground. So I'd like to thank you for making this a very special evening for us. Thank Thanks so much. much. Thank you very much.